Now we want to start going over to chapter 5 of the book and talk about graph neural networks. We have discussed the shallow embedding based approaches in the previous chapters and there are many things that are going to be different in this chapter as we go over the concepts related to graph neural networks and their applications. Now the main, he the main thing to consider here is that we basically want to propose more complex encoder modules and we want to utilize any sort of feature vector that is associated with the nodes in the graph as well as the structure of the graph in order to obtain um, you know, more concise and more informative uh, representations associated with each, with each of the nodes or with the graph. We already know that in different domains, for example, in image recognition, we know that the parameter sharing in the style of convolutional neural networks is the state of the art and is a pretty good and convenient and fit architecture for that task. We know that in dealing with sequences, things such as recurrent neural networks and transformers are very effective. Now the question is, what types of properties should an architecture proposed for the task of dealing with a graph neural network situation um, have that basically makes it a good and a fit model for the tasks at hand. The first thing we want to discuss has to do with the permutation invariance and equivariance. And that comes with basically paying attention to whether or not the order of the representations of the nodes is important. Now, one reasonable idea, one would say, in dealing with some sort of, with, with basically applying a machine learning model to graphs, is that we can take the adjacency matrix. So let's say this is the adjacency matrix. And let's say this is going to be ith row of the adjacency matrix A for basically this means one, two. Tell the number of nodes. Now you can basically flatten the adjacency matrix so let's go over something so we basically want to propose to use the adjacency matrix as the feature vector characterizing the entire graph and one thing we can do is that let's say this is the concatenation operation we can have this for i from one to all of the nodes and this is going to be the feature vector. And the dimension of it obviously is going to be this. Now, well, you can basically give it to a multilayer perceptron. And this is going to give you an output, which is a vector associated with the graph. Now, what is the main immediate problem that comes to mind? The main immediate problem that comes to mind is that this adjacency matrix has basically enforced some sort of arbitrary order over the nodes. And when you're basically concatenating these representations, this means that your feature vector is going to first have the, you know, feature associated with node one and two and three and four. And when it comes to dealing with a graph, it's sort of like sometimes looking at certain, like a certain set and representing a set is not the same as representing your list. And this order and this overindulgence with the order in this methodology that is just proposed is going to cause a lot of problems. Another way of putting it is that this proposed model is not permutation invariant. Now, when it comes to processing graphs and associating features with graphs and things like that, permutation invariance is a critical desired characteristic. In mathematical terms, means that if you have a, basically a function f that takes the adjacency matrix A, if you have any permutation P, you basically must have this being equal to, to this. And if it is not the case, you want to have permutation equivariance, which means this. So one of these two must be satisfied. 
Note that this means that the permutation of the input doesn't impact the output, and this is called permutation invariance. The permutation equivariance means that the permuting the input is going to have the same effect and the same permutation on the output. Considering a graph as a network of nodes, um, when we were discussing what exactly motivated the architecture is related to, for example, graph neural networks, there have been a variety of articles, a variety of perspectives. Um, for example, GNNs are believed to have to do, for example, with the generalization of convolution to non-Euclidean data as differentiable variant of belief propagation and similar to, for example, the graph isomorphism tests that we discussed before. Now, the main idea has to do with some sort of a message passing, meaning that we want vector messages to be exchanged between the nodes, and we want them to basically uh, allow the representations to be updated using a uh, neural network, for instance. Now, let's go over the notation for uh, basically discussing the message passing framework. So first, as usual, you have your graph G, which is composed of set of nodes V and set of edges E. You this time also have a d-dimensional feature vector for each one of your nodes. You want to use this information in order to obtain a dz-dimensional output for every node of your graph. So this is for basically generating representations for nodes, and we're going to also talk about um, you know, examples of generating representation for subgraphs and for the entire graph. Considering a node in this message passing framework, at a certain iteration or during each one of the message passing iterations, there is going to be a hidden state associated with this node. Let's say this is node u and you're at iteration k. And there is this hidden uh, embedding of sorts. Think about, for example, LSDMs or recurrent neural networks and things like that. So there is a hidden embedding associated with the node that in each in each stage or iteration of the message passing framework is going to uh, be updated. And the thing that basically plays an important role, the other player in this game that, may, that plays an important role in this update is the neighborhood of node u. Let's take a look at this informative figure in the in the book. So here is basically how a single node aggregates messages from its local neighborhood. The model aggregates messages from A's local graph neighbors, which are B, C, and D. And in turn, also messages coming from these neighbors are based on information aggregated from their respective neighborhoods, and so on. This means a two-layer version of a message passing model is going to work as shown in this figure. So let's look at the iteration uh, rule for updating this hidden embedding or hidden state associated with node u at iteration k transitioning to iteration k plus 1. So this is the thing that we want to know. The update at iteration k will basically take the previous hidden representation that we had along with some form of aggregation some form of aggregation over the hidden states or hidden embeddings of the nodes that are a neighborhood of the node in question and this can be written for example as m because it basically comprises the message from neighborhood nodes. In the context of node representation, the first state could be defined as, for instance, the original input features. And after k iterations, this could be of r, for example, one dimension, and certain dimension d1. And hk can be, for instance, the representations that, for example, are on dz or d2 or whatever. Now the thing is, the aggregate part and update both are differentiable and aggregate takes a set as input. That means that by default it's going to be, uh, by definition it's going to be a permutation invariant. Now one thing that you see here mainly as a 
you know, a special point of focus is these node features or for example, X use. Now, the thing is in many of the examples, uh, for example, in social media um, networks and things as such, we are going to have a rich set of features associated with each of the nodes. But if there is no features associated with the nodes and if only thing that you have as the structure, there are potential options. One is to basically assign a one hot vector with a node assigned an embedding or something of that sort. And another option is to basically use node statistics, which is something that was discussed before. So as discussed before, the main idea behind a graph neural network architecture is basically allowing the message passing framework to help getting information from uh, different reaches of the graph to each node. This means, for example, in the first step of the, uh, the first iteration, the node is going to receive information, uh, aggregate information from its neighborhoods, and it will be used to update its feature vector. And therefore, after k iterations, we have the k hop neighborhood of node you to deal with. So in one iteration, you basically have access to your neighbors. In two iterations, two hop uh, neighborhood. And in k iterations, k hop neighborhoods, of course. And this is uh, kind of critical because you want to basically have two types of information, message passing, and kind of encode two types of information in your uh, node features. And one is the structural information that has to do with the structure of the graph. And two is basically uh, features and updated features that represent the semantics of the task at hand for the node uh, in question. So we talked about the general update rule for the uh, graph neural networks and we said that we have this embedding for the node u at iteration k and this is defined as a differentiable update which works based on the previous hidden state for node u and some aggregation module that takes this set of neighbors of u and uh, their states and it will basically help with this update rule that we have here. Now the thing is let's come up with the most basic example for this kind of talk about what the update and aggregate would be. This was proposed in these two references in the book and it is defined this way. So in obtaining the, U, uh, the hidden representation or hidden embedding for node u at iteration k, you have this function. One kind of important remark is that the number of layers in the GNN are basically associated most often with the different uh, iterations considered in the message passing. Now you can see that for each layer you have this weights, these parameters, and this parameters. Now this is the bias term. We can see the aggregation here is basically summation and then multiplication by this matrix. And the update rule is basically summing these up and passing them to the sigma function. And sigma here is basically an activation function. For example, it could be ReLU, it could be tangent hyperbolic, and things like that. Note that these could be shared between the layers or could be defined individually for each one of the layers. And also note that if you want to write this one based on the message aggregation and update formula, we basically are going to have that the message coming from neighbors is going to be the sum aggregation of the hidden states of the neighbors and that the update rule which takes the hidden state of a node u 
and the message coming from the neighbors of nerd u is going to be defined as the nonlinearity applied on v self on h u plus v neighbors on message coming from the neighbors of u, for instance, plus b. To write the same thing, uh, but this time vector in, in a vectorized form and for the entire graph, we are going to have this. So here's the vectorized form of it. Note that hk is going to be this dimensions in this formula. And this means basically applying the w self on it can change this, but it leaves this one intact so that when you have the ht, you again have this as the first dimension. And in here, we can see the role of the adjacency matrix is to basically bring together the nodes uh, representations for the neighbors of a stuff to certain node u because you basically have to in order to get this item for ht you're going to have the corresponding row in the adjacency matrix which has the neighbors and then you have like you know the edge matrix and it's going to basically, this multiplied by that is going to give you the summation of the corresponding rows. And then you, of course, will apply the W uh, for the neighbors there. And then you're going to basically get those outputs. Now, given our discussion, one way to basically simplify these equations is to add a self loop and then when you're doing the aggregation, considering the set of nodes that are neighbors to you, adding the self loop means you add the u to that set as well. And you basically use the aggregation only and you get the new result. Now there's uh, basically pros and cons for this. The pros is better for overfitting as it is a simplified and straightforward approach it's kind of similar to the relationship between guru and lsdm in some sense and in terms of cons is that the expressiveness of the model goes down because you cannot You cannot differentiate between the messages in the sense of whether or not it comes from the neighborhoods of neighbors of you or the you itself. Now let's see what happens to the thing that we discussed before. So in the vectorized format, we had this. Now here, Adding self loop means you're gonna basically uh, render these two the same and we'll be you know adding self loop results in this formula. You have the nonlinearity. This time you also have the self loop, meaning that the diagonal elements of the adjacency matrix will become one as well, and then you have edge for the previous iteration times wt and we call this the self loop gnn approach now what we discussed was kind of like the simplest version of the gnn and now we're going to have to talk about how to improve upon what we had so far so in the previous approach that was the simplest we saw that the aggregate function is basically the summation The summation of the uh, nodes in the neighborhood of u 
over basically the embedding vector associated with each one of them. Now, there is an immediate problem with this, and that is the sensitivity to node degree, meaning that if you have, for example, generally the same uh, magnitude distribution for your nodes, in the next iteration, the node that had 10,000 neighbors is going to have significantly different uh, value range than the node that had 10 neighbors. And this can lead to a lot of numerical instabilities. Now, the simplest approach to kind of deal with that is that when you're considering the message coming from the neighbors of you, you can essentially do the same thing as before, neighbors of u, v, and h, v of k. Uh, I'm going to omit the index k. Yeah, so you take the embeddings for the neighbors, and you divide this to the node degree, which is now the number of neighbors of node u. However, there are some other uh, alternatives that also have found success in the previous research in graph neural networks. One of them is called symmetric normalization, and it is defined like this. So for every node in the adjacency of u, you take the representation of that node, and you divide it by this. Basically, the degree of node u times the degree of node v, and under a square root. This means that the nodes that have a that that are neighbors of u and have a lower degree, um, their message or their embedding is going to be more important in comp in, in composing the uh, embedding uh, for the next iteration for node u. And we had this before, and the assumption that the nodes that are less connected and are, that that are the neighbors of you are going to be more informative and are going to be treated as more important nodes. This is something that is motivated by the spectral graph theory and uh, the later chapter of the book, later chapters of the books will also go over these relationships as well. The main example that motivated the authors in building this is the citations and let's say a paper here is this node has been cited too many times so when assuming the connection, uh, the basically, uh, when you have the task of the inferring community membership in a graph, these papers are not going to be very informative because they are cited a lot of times at different domains. And they contribute very little to basically reducing the entropy of the task at hand. Then there's the graph convolutional networks, or GCNs, that employ this symmetric normalization uh, in their self-group approach. And their update rule is this. So you have the neighbors of node u along with the node u itself. So you have a self loop. And you take the representations and you do divide them by the rule of the symmetric normalization. And basically, you have this. And this is one of the most famous and effective approaches uh, in the graph. Uh, representation learning. Now a critical question is raised here and that is whether or not to do normalization. Um, one thing to consider is that when we were talking about like the basic aggregation of sum, that sort of aggregation is more powerful than you know normalizing the results because by normalizing the results it can lead to a loss of information of some sorts. For example, normalizing by the degree, it's going to make it harder or even impossible to kind of tell nodes apart based on their degrees. So uh, it basically has to do with a lot of things such as numerical stability of the framework that you're proposing and things like that. But it kind of comes back to the application as well. Like if the semantics of the feature vectors associated with the nodes are more important than the structure, normalization is generally a better idea. And if the structure is pretty more important, then maybe uh, more thought is needed. We discussed that being able to represent sets is an important component when it comes to interpreting um, and discussing and understanding graph neural networks. So in this section, we're going to go over the set aggregators and talk about different types of methodologies that are proposed to do so. Now, we know that the aggregation part mainly plays this part in receiving the messages from the neighboring nodes, including possibly the self-loop.
Now, we discussed the normalizer, normalizers and normalizations as a possible way of improving them, uh, facing problems such as numerical instabilities. Now, the question is, can we do more than normalization in order to improve the aggregation module in graph neural networks? When we are performing the aggregation, the input to that aggregation is a set, namely, for node u, the input is this. The embedding HVs for all of the Vs that are basically nodes of the neighborhood of U. And in the case where the self loop is added, we can have something like that as well. But for the sake of argument, let's just look at this for now. The idea is that basically the input is a set. That means the methodology that works on it, by definition, should be permutation invariance. And we want to turn this into an aggregate message. Let us talk about set pooling. A principled and well approach to um, defining an aggregation aggregator function in the graph neural networks is based on the theory of permutation invariant neural networks. For example, we have this um, way of approaching this problem. So let's first write the formula. This message, this is neighbors of node u. So we have this MOP here and this MOP here. So you could think think of it as a local global approach, which is because of this sum component permutation invariant. And this article has shown that this is a universal a universal approximator for set functions. And MLP means arbitrarily deep uh, multilayer perception. Now it has also been so it is also possible to, for example, substitute this summation here with max pooling or min pooling or something like that. And some other works, for example, such as graph sage pooling, has used the normalizations that we discussed earlier instead of this. Now, even though in theory this works and MLPs can be arbitrarily deep, usually in practice it's going to be one or two layers, and the reason is that, um, you know, the deeper the network, the higher the chances of overfitting, and uh, with a shallow MLP, the risk of overfitting is uh, smaller. Now, let's talk about Genesee pooling. Now, in what we had before in the set pooling, we basically were... Um, applying a permutation invariant function and we relied on basically summation or max pooling or min pooling in order to kind of enforce this uh, indifference towards permutation. Now in Genesee pooling the situation is a little bit different. This time we consider several permutations and this time we apply a permutation sensitive function and then basically kind of um, average over these latent space uh, representations. So in order to represent that, let's say PI is a permutation over the set of nodes V. And again, let's consider, for example, a set this. And now applied, basically if PI is applied on it, we can say it's going to map this set to this now what we do here is that in order to compute this we have an MLP applied but the input to this MLP is for all of the permutations and we will discuss that if we consider all of the permutations. Again, in theory, this could be a universal set function approximator. So we take each one of the potential um, permutations, 
And then we apply a permutation sensitive function. to this and we basically have the output. Now there is one problem with this which is basically the fact that yes now we have all the possible permutations and having all possible permutations as you can imagine is not a is not always a tractable solution so there are usually two approaches to kind of deal with this and one of these approaches is good enough. One approach is to sample a random subset of the permutations and basically use that. This is similar to, for example, negative sampling and things like that, where you, you know, sample uh, not everything, but good enough uh, examples. And the other part is, the other solution is to employ a canonical approach. For example, sort the nodes based on the descending order of their degrees and randomly break the ties and something like that. So these two approaches are basically the main keys in making this methodology tractable. Now this study has investigated the genesis type pooling and the set pooling and showed that on several synthetic evaluation setups the genesis type pooling actually has some advantages and shows better improvements upon the previous set pooling based approaches. Now let's talk about using a tension mechanism in the aggregation layer and as you can imagine this is going to be very uh, intuitive and very efficient in, in many aspects. Now the first type of GNN models that were proposed to utilize a tension network in this way is proposed in this article, which is called Graph Attention Network or GAT. And as you can probably imagine, in order to compute NU, we can have this sum. But this time, instead of like naively pooling, we had some alpha uv that basically were a result of applying attention somehow between u and v times hv. And I kind of showed the affinity of hv towards hu and something like that. Now, in this paper, the attentions are defined like this. In this formula, a is a trainable uh, parameter, w is as well. And what you can see here is basically that you have some sort of a softmax over these features that are basically, so you modify the uh, representation of U and you basically also map the representation of V, concatenate them, and then basically compute the inner product with A and then do a softmax and you will get to H to alpha U and V. That shows somehow how, uh, Good enough they are so in order to fuse their relationships in order to kind of propose a measure of similarity what you do is that you concatenate the projected features you do the inner product without it with a another variance of these attentions is basically uh the bilinear attention model in which you define the alpha between u and v to be again you will have some sort of a softmax this time you have a bilinear product between the two And again, you have the softmax form applied. Another form, which is also acceptable, is to have an MLP. And again, you have the softmax again. Note that the MLP here is expected to uh, output a scalar value. It is also common to use multi head attention in which you're going to have again, you're going to have alpha uv hv. This time, you're going to have k index as well for each one of the heads. You're going to compute each one of these aggregate messages and have usually a linear projection as well leaving you with this and then the message is going to be computed by concatenating the outputs for different heads now what is the connection to the transformers model um, if you consider the, the graph is basically fully connected and if you don't consider like that position encoding and things like that um, having a transformer is going to kind of 
be pretty similar to what we have discussed before on the graph neural networks using attention. And actually numerous works have investigated things like that. And the good thing about it is that you can use a lot of libraries that are already developed for using transformers. Now the drawback is having to deal with this order of computation. And note that if we do what we discussed before, we would have for each node, we would consider the neighbors, so we would have this complexity, which is a lot smaller. Um, so again, using attention is kind of a better way to gauge how much um, information you're going to receive from each one of the neighbors. And if there is a prior knowledge indicating that some neighbors are more informative than others, and this difference in informativeness is very significant, then attention-based methodologies are, um, you know, a pretty good fit to um, do this. So as we discussed before, when it comes to a GNN, there are two key components. One of them is the aggregate function, and the other one is the update. Now, since the intro introduction of things such as GraphSage, this aggregate module has been the basically the component of the GNN that received most of the attention. By the way, this is an N, not an M. Um, however, this component, the update one, was you know mostly not as famous as the aggregate when it came to research works. So far, we considered one of the you know basic and most straightforward approaches to enforce the update module and the basically like a linear network and something like that. In this part of the lectures, we want to go over what kind of improvements we can apply to the update module of a GNN. Now we want to talk about oversmoothing and neighborhood influence. Oversmoothing is a main problem in GNNs that basically has to do with the update component. And the material that we discuss here, mainly the generalized update methods, can help dealing with this issue. One thing to note is that oversmoothing is uh, more likely to be observed in, for example, in self-loop approaches and has been more common in the graphs that basically use a self-loop uh, approach. Now, the problem of oversmoothing is that after multiple uh, layers and after several iterations of message passing and things like that, the representations of all of the nodes become roughly the same and therefore uh, not that informative for the tasks that we usually have at hand. To formalize this notation, let's consider the representation of a node U to be the first representation for the first layer of your GNN. And then the final embedding layer is going to be K. This is the final embedding layer for the um, node U. Now you can write I, K, U, and V which is going to be read influence of node u on node v to be defined like this. This means that this value, in other words, the influence of node u on v, is going to be the sum of all of the elements of the Jacobian matrix that is here. And this can be used as a measure that helps us determine how much of an influence the node u and its initial representations as values within the structure of this graph have on the final representations that we will obtain on node v. Now let's talk about the theorem. The theorem we discuss here states that for any GNN model with a self-loop that we have an aggregate module defined on it like this, meaning that you're going to have a function f, which is an arbitrary differentiable normalization function. As you can see, it's going to take, uh, it has the domain of R plus, and it goes to R plus. So you can see that this is a very common way of defining the aggregate functions based on what we discussed so far for a self-loop approach. Then, when we are discussing the influence of node u on node v, we can say that it has a direct relationship with pgk uh, uv. 
sorry, let me correct this. And PGK Hugh given V is the probability of visiting the node that you influences, the, the node that is being influenced. So it's the probability of visiting node V on a length k random walk that starts from node u. So ik of uv is going to be proportional to the probability of visiting node v in a k-step random walk started from node u. More on this can be found in this article that is one of the, book, uh, one of the book's uh, references. And the theorem one in that article has a direct connection with this theorem. Now, the point that is important about this theorem is this. With what we have discussed so far, if you approach k to infinity, then the influence of every node is going to kind of approach the stationary The stationary distribution of random walks over the graph. One other practical element is that in many of the real world examples of these graph networks and models that can be modeled, uh, that the data that can be modeled with graphs, is that you're going to have these high degree nodes and resemble expander graphs, so to speak. Now, for this sort of uh, situation, you basically have this order of magnitude as k in order to converge to an almost uniform uh, distribution. Now, so far we've been talking about the self-loop-based approaches, but even if we consider the general case, if we have something like this, which meaning that the parameters associated with the aggregator um, and the part that has to do with neighbors, if this dominates the term, then we are going to be kind of asymptotically have the same problem that we discussed for the self-loop-based approaches. Now, the main implication of what we discussed here is that if we ignore the problem of over-smoothing, building a deeper GNN is going to hurt the performance because it is more likely to approach uniform representations over all of the nodes. And this makes distinguishing between them for certain tasks, um, it's going to be more difficult. And therefore, it is something that we need to know about. So now we're going to talk about concatenation and the skip connections. Before that, let's again let again consider a node again. And we can intuitively say that oversmoothing happens when the importance of the message coming from the neighbors of this node U is kind of dominating the update for the representation on iteration k plus one. And it's going to basically depend more on this than on the representation of the node from the previous iteration. And concatenation and skip connections is a way to kind of counteract that to some degree. Here is an example of concatenation as a modification to the update module in the GNN. So you have the update module as usual. And this time you have the concatenation version of that, which takes the edge U and the message coming from the neighbors of node U. And it basically will be the original basic updates that we had it's going to be applied on its U and a message coming from the neighbors of U. And this time it's going to be concatenated. Remember that this notation in the book is for concatenation with the previous representation. And then this is going to be the out out output of the update. And again, the thing to just notice as the main difference between this and the basic one is that you are also explicitly giving the module in the next layer the uh, explicit value that the exact value of the uh, node representation for node u in, a, in an attempt to kind of disentangle the information that you had previously on this node along with the new aggregated version of the information uh, that was expected to, to be received after the basic update. As a practical example, this was also used in GraphSage framework. Another way to deal with this is this sort of a um, linear interpolation method that for me personally it reminds me of you know the original LSTM connections and like things such as forget gates and uh, those stuff but again this one is also pretty easy to understand so you have the update this time you have the linear interpolation version of the update which again is going to use the original update as a main component of it so you have the 
node representation for node u you have the message coming from neighbors of node u and this time again you have the basic update and you have the original message what happens this time is that this is an entity it's an element wise uh, multiplication and you're going to have uh, two vectors as kind of knobs to tune how much of a contribution each one of the elements from these two vectors are going to make to the new representation one of them is going to be alpha one the other one is going to be alpha two you use element wise multiplication to help these um, tune the parameters and then you have uh, basically the summation of them as the final representation and note that if basically this is of dimension d and this is of dimension d alpha one is as well as alpha two are members of rd as you can see here alpha alpha one and alpha two are gating vectors now these alphas themselves can like, themselves can be basically they should be trained most of the time and they can be trained in a variety of ways the book mentions this reference as an example and here in order to update the alphas the proposed methodology used a separate single layer GNN that took basically the hidden layer representations as features. So we talked about concatenation and residual connections and these are also very helpful in terms of numerical stability of the optimization scheme um, in your training methodology. And as you can see, the idea is pretty very similar to things such as ResNet in the ImageNet, uh, in the image recognition and computer vision domains. And the book mentions that a great use of these types of algorithms and these types of structures is on the tasks that exhibit homophily, meaning that the local neighborhood and their features are strongly important for the task at hand. Let's look at the gated updates and to kind of understand the material, let's, let's consider a single node again and its neighbors. So as we discussed before, we have a representation for node u and then from all of its neighbors we will have a message what does that remind you in this update accurate methodology this reminds you probably of things such as recurrent neural networks and this would be your input and this would be the hidden state so to speak in like for example something like gru and we can define for example huk to be gru with this hidden state and this input. Note that the parameters of this GRU here is going to be shared between the nodes. This type of approach, this type of a gated update approach, has been shown to be effective for deep GNN architectures that are roughly over 10 layers. And they have also been shown to be helpful in the prediction tasks that have to do with the complex reasoning over the global structure of the graph, which again has to do with the fact that it works well on the very deep uh, GNNs. Then there is also the concept of jumping knowledge connections and the fact that uh, so when we are talking about the final representation for a node, we usually are talking about the final uh, embedding layer. And this assumption and its limitations are mainly the reason why people think about things such as the concatenation connections and residual connections and things like that to kind of alleviate uh, the problems that uh, happen such as over smoothing now very uh, well how do I put this a kind of a more intuitive approach also is to kind of concatenate the representations for the node u in all of the steps and then feed them to fjk in order to obtain the final embedding and this is called basically jumping knowledge connections and this can often be an identity function, meaning that your final representation would be the concatenation of the different representations at different layers that, you know, you could, for example, think that have to do with different hops and different path lengths. This was first proposed in this reference. And in that, they've been using things like an approach such as max pooling and uh, long short-term memory attention layers. Now, so far, our main point of discussions was basically on simple graphs.
but in many applications we have like a multi-relational graph and other types of graphs in which you know considering edge features are also necessary so let's review some of these methods the first part is about relational graph neural networks with relational graph convolutional network approach being a famous example of that now in this example when you're doing this aggregation this time the type of the edge also matters so this is neighbors of node u based on relationship tau and again this is going to be for all of the relationships then you're going to have this fate that is a specific per relationship applied on the node representations and you have some normalization function like that so it is essentially this component that makes a difference and uh, plays an important part in differentiating between the different edges and edge types. Now, let's say you have a lot of you know different types of relationships. You have to add like a WT for each one of W tall for each one of them, and that leads to a drastic increase in the number of parameters that you have to train for your model to work properly. One way to alleviate that problem is that you can have a set of basis matrices. And this basically means that when you're considering to find w tau, for that tau, you basically represent that as a linear combination of these basis matrices. So kind of substituting these two, you will get this new formula. So for all relationships tau, and all of the nodes that based on relationship tau are considered a neighbor of u, you're gonna have now in this notation B is basically found by stacking B1 up until B B. And this operations you know times one and times two indicate the tensor product along mode i here are some examples of these relational graph neural networks from the book let's read this together for example a variation of this approach meaning you know the relational graph uh, neural networks without parameter sharing without parameter sharing is used in this work for modeling a multi-relational data set, including drugs, disease, and proteins, which is a famous example of multi-relational situation. A similar strategy has been leveraged by this resource, internalized linguistic dependency graphs. And some other works have also found success with RGCN style aggregation. And this is another example reference that has to do with this. Lastly, we have attention and feature concatenation to discuss. Our discussion so far had to do with, you know, having discrete uh, edge types, but sometimes these features or the representations associated with its edges are more general. In this case, one um, interesting thing to do is that consider any aggregation that you had, for example, the basic one. You had HV for all of the neighboring nodes of U. This time, one thing you can do is to concatenate it with a certain embedding that has to do with this. This basically is a feature vector for that specific edge that connects U to V. And this has also shown to be very successful if used with uh, attention-based approaches. So it's good to know this as well. So far, we mostly talked about obtaining representations for each node of the graph. How about obtaining a representation such as EG that basically describes the graph one easy approach is basically just aggregating the found node representations and as always have some sort of normalization uh, coefficient this is a simplest approach a more complicated approach is to use some sort of a recurrent neural network in this case you can for example use a long short-term memory and the way to use it is that you have a q vector So let's say you have a Q vector that you set it to all zeros, and you also have the output vector to be all zeros. This is O, this is zeros. And then the way you do this at every step is that you take the previous O, you take the previous Q, 
and you use it in order to obtain the new queue. And this queue serves as the query for your retention function, meaning that you're going to use um, the final representation for any node v with q for any node in the graph. And this is going to give you this, that at iteration t and for node v, this is some sort of logit for it. And then you compute the alpha by essentially doing softmax on this. And then you take O to be using these attentions and these Vs, obtain the results. And here there's this notation mistake. This is T. And that is it. And the representation associated with the graph is often going to be the concatenation of all of these O values. Now, this is a pretty good approach and it's pretty effective in many scenarios. The problem with it is that it kind of ignores the structural information of the graph. So it doesn't really consider the graph structure. A way to alleviate that, or kind of an alternative approach, is graph coarsening, which has to do with clustering the graph in some sense. So what you kind of accept is that you have, as your assumption, the fact that you can there exists some sort of a clustering function that takes G as well as the node features and gives you this, meaning that you can assign a cluster to each one of the nodes. So there is an assignment matrix S and SUI is going to be a positive number. And this is the strength of the association between node U and cluster I. Then you're going to use the coruscant, uh, you, you're going to use this S and you're going to get a new adjacency matrix. And then you're also going to get a new feature matrix by applying this to X. And this is going to give you a feature vector per cluster. So you're coarsening the graph. And this is motivated by pooling approaches in CNN and kind of this pyramid format. And here, even though this is pretty, uh, it's going to, it's, it can be pretty effective in practice, there are cases in which this becomes very complicated to train. And also this clustering approach, for example, if you think about the spectral graph clustering and things like that, given the fact that this F had to be differentiable, those are out of a out of option. And so those are not a good option for us. So that's also going to add additional complexity to the situation. Now let's discuss the most general way to kind of formulate the generalized message passing. And this is going to serve as some sort of a good intuition and also a recap of the previously discussed material. This time you're going to have to use them. You, you basically want to use the information and an embedding for edges nodes as well as one global embedding that represents the entire graph in all the stages of your basically processings. So the first thing that you do is that you update the edge representations. So the inputs are for each edge UV, you had certain features. You also had certain features for nodes. Yeah, so in order to, so, sorry. So when you're updating the edge features, you consider the previous edge features, you consider the neighboring nodes, basically the two nodes that connect, that this edge connect together, as well as the full uh, graph embedding. So this is the first step, this is step one. Now you utilize these edge features, and this time you have an aggregation system. So for each V that is 
a neighbor of you. You take the edge that connects you to V and you use its representations at the previous stage and you have an aggregate module that helps you obtain the message coming from neighbors. And so this is the step two. Now the step three, you're gonna update the node representations. And this time you have the update for node. And how you do that is that you take the previous representation, you take the message coming from the neighbors, and you have the full graph embedding that you can assume that it has some information about the structure and about like the overall um, graph task as well. And now the fourth part, of course, is going to update the full graph embedding, which is done this way. So let's say this one is for the full graph. You're going to have the previous graph representation. You have all of the node representations. And you also have all of the edge representations. This, for the graph level thing, usually a pooling sort of approach is used to obtain it. And as you can see, this is going to be like the, you know, most generalized format to describe this message passing that goes on in a graph neural network.